All right, uh, let's get our Bibles out and turn to Luke chapter 9. We are, uh, we're going through our Life of Christ series. And uh, last time we studied uh, in some detail the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount. As I said before at the beginning of this series, we're not, this is not an exhaustive series on the life of Christ. We generally want to hit the highlights and we want to do it in uh, chronological order. And the series is already going on much longer than I had anticipated that it would, <laughs> which is typical for my uh, teaching. <laughs> so we're going to skip over a few things. You know, some of the miracles that Jesus did and so forth, some of the places he went. Um, it's just more of the same, some of the kinds of things that we have seen in the past. But what I want to talk about now uh, is in Luke chapter 9. You remember last time um, Jesus he had a group of followers and he took all of his followers up into this mountain and he specifically named the 12 out from among the rest of his followers. He had a special, what we might call an inner group of disciples, um, 12 disciples, and he gives their names. And then the Sermon on the Mount, he is uh, instructing them in, uh, in the ways of, in his ways, the ways of the kingdom and how they should live as his followers. Now we get to chapter 9, which is just a short time later in Luke. He suddenly gives these, these men who really have just started following him, who are still just learning his ways, he gives them a great deal of responsibility and authority. And that seems rather surprising, doesn't it? Usually you think, well, if you're going to train somebody, you're going to you know, they need to be instructed for quite a long time before you're going to, you know, start easing them into maybe the role of teaching. Isn't that right? Isn't that how we would normally think? But Jesus didn't do that. He brought these, he, he started having these guys start teaching and preaching almost right away. And that's rather, that's rather remarkable. Because actually, I'll be honest with you, you learn more by teaching than you do by sitting there listening to me. Did you know that? Ask Stephen. He'll tell you, Walter, too. You actually learn more by having to teach. Well, let's look at what happened here. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples, as opposed to the great a mass of disciples, together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Now, notice, notice he is not saying, look, I'm going to have you, uh, you know, maybe do an intro to one of my messages. <laughs> he didn't go with them. He sent them, two by two, to go out and preach the same message that he had been preaching, and to heal the sick and so forth. He says, verse 4, whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, preaching the gospel, what is that? Is that what you normally hear, the gospel, when you go to, you know, your typical Baptist church or any church that you're familiar with, and they preach the gospel? Is that what, he, is that what they were preaching? No, why, what's the difference? Before and after. Before and after what? His, um, You're on the right track. Before and after his death yes. and resurrection. Yes. Oh, and resurrection. Right? Yes. Because when you typically hear the gospel today in a church, what do you hear? Jesus died yes. for your sins. He rose from the dead. He paid the penalty for you. You can be saved. Okay, well, that's, is that part of the gospel? Yes. But when they, they went out, he sent them out to preach the gospel before he had been crucified, before he had been resurrected, and even before he had even told them that he was going to be crucified and resurrected. As we'll see shortly, for the very first time, he tells them about that after he sent them out to preach the gospel. Now, isn't that amazing? So what was the gospel they were preaching? If they weren't preaching that Jesus died and he rose again and now you can be saved if you believe on him, 
What were they? What gospel were they preaching? The, the good news of the kingdom. That's the gospel message we see all throughout the gospel. The gospels is the good news of the kingdom. That is, the kingdom is coming. Christ Jesus is the king. He's the Messiah that had been prophesied throughout the Old Testament. And he is going to establish his kingdom on the earth. And you can have a part of that. You can have an inheritance then. You can have eternal life in his kingdom. All right? The way by which they would receive eternal life, that is through the remission of sins because of his death, hadn't been fully revealed yet. All right? Even to the disciples. All right, so let's continue reading. Verse 6, So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard, all these that, uh, blah, 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 heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. Now Herod had killed John. He beheaded John. And some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Now, this is fascinating. Some people were saying that some old dead guys have come back from the dead. <laughs> John the Baptist, or Elijah, or one of the other prophets. And notice it doesn't say that they you know, just appeared as reincarnations or something. It's that they, came, they were risen again, that this is what some people were saying. Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned. Now, I want you to note this. Underline the word apostles. And then go back in, ver in verse 1 of chapter 9 and underline where it says he called his 12 disciples. Is this, are they the same people or are they different people? They're the same people. But they have a different title. Why? Because he had sent them out with his authority. That defines an apostle. All right. What does the word apostle mean? One who, sent on one who is sent on a mission with the authority of the person who sent him. That's what the word apostle means. What does disciple mean? A student. A student, one who's learning, one who's following. Totally different roles, aren't they? But he took his 12 disciples, and by giving them a commission and sending them, they became apostles. All right? It's important to understand what these terms mean. All right, so now he's calling them apostles. All right, uh, verse, um, verse 10, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. When he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Now notice, notice the topic of discussion. You know, we, 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 we have seen throughout uh, our study in the life of Christ that John the Baptist went out proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus went out preaching from the very beginning of his ministry the good news or the gospel of the kingdom, right? We see this throughout. And whenever you see the word the gospel, that's essentially what it's meaning, the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the coming kingdom. And so now crowds are coming to Jesus. His disciples have gone out. They went from town to town. They were preaching messages in Israel. They've come back. And now crowds of people are coming to hear Jesus. And what does he speak to them about? The kingdom of God. You know, you should put a note next to that, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 is a series of parables. It's one parable after another parable after another parable where Jesus is, is likening something that they might have been familiar with to the kingdom of God. And he starts out by saying the kingdom of God is like, and then he gives a story. Like, for example, a sower who sowed um, you know, good seed in his field, and the enemy came and sowed bad seed in his field. And then he says the kingdom of God is like, um, you know, he talks about another farmer who, who, you know, throws out his seed and some falls on good ground and some falls on bad ground and, and all the stuff that happens to it. The kingdom of God is like a fisherman fishing who takes in all this fish and then at the end he gathers and he separates the good from the bad. And he says that's how it's going to be at the end of the age. God is going to separate the wicked from among the just and so forth. And he, he keeps going on. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. He tells all these stories uh, for comparison of the kingdom of God. That was the main theme of all of Jesus' preaching while he was here. The coming of the kingdom and what it's like 
and what it's going to be like in the days and years leading up to the coming of his kingdom. Verse 12. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitudes away that they may go into the uh, surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for, for we are in a deserted place here. They're out in the country. <laughs> we like that, don't we, Diane? But he said to them, you give, you give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about... You know, they probably had to drive, I don't know, 17 miles into Simpsonville probably to get food. Never mind, that's a joke that only <laughs> Diane would understand. <laughs> For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so, and he made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. 12 baskets of leftovers from five loaves and two fish after a multitude has eaten. Okay. And it happened as he was alone praying that the disciples joined him, and, and he asked them, saying, what, what do the, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, this is interesting because we had earlier, we read where Herod, was contemplating who is this Jesus that's out there doing all these miracles and stuff? Who is, who is he really? And, and, you know, he was contemplating some of the people said John the Baptist had risen, some said Elijah had come, some said he's one of the other prophets that's come back from the dead, and so forth. And so now, this question is obviously the question of the day. Not just in Herod's mind, but even in the crowds of people that are coming to hear Jesus. So Jesus says to them, who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. Which, that sounds kind of funny, because if you remember, John the Baptist baptized Jesus, <laughs> right? Before he was beheaded by Herod. So if anybody knew about that, it'd be kind of hard to say that this was John the Baptist, but apparently some people, you know, they hadn't, hadn't been around then. Uh, some say Elijah, and others say one of the old prophets has risen again. So we got the same things that Herod was uh, contemplating. Now, let me ask you a question. Why would some people say Elijah had come back from the dead? Malachi 4. All right, what does Malachi 4 say? Prophesied that he would return, that great prophet would return before the day of the Lord. Okay, that's right. In the last verses of the Old Testament is a prophecy that Elijah the prophet will return before the coming day of judgment, the coming day of the Lord. All right, and uh, actually on Friday night when we have the Passover here, we typically have, because the Jews do, a place set for Elijah. He's never, he never shows up, at least not yet, <laughs> right? But the reason that's done is to remind us of the prophecy that Elijah the prophet will come before the day of judgment um, arrives, according to what the Old Testament said, and the New Testament as well. All right, but then Jesus says, but he said to them, who do you say that I am? Oh, all right. What the crowds say is really not really that important. What his disciples say, or who he is, is extremely important. And it says, Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Now, what does that mean? The Christ of God. Oh, somebody says something? I'm sorry? Messiah. Okay, that's what the word Christ means, Messiah. But what, what is the background of this terminology? Where did Peter, Peter just didn't pull words out of thin air. He, had, he meant something by it. Something that was common knowledge, right? So where does this come from? Uh, yes. Good. All right, well, let's look there. Um, of course, we bet we've looked there. Like you got So often you guys should have memorized it by now. <clears throat> but let's go back, back there. to. <laughs> yeah, whatever the question is, the answer is Psalm chapter 2. <laughs> Actually, I had notes in my margin from a previous time. From a previous time. <laughs> um, before, you might come back to this. I, I might, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I had a thought as we were going through this, and um, when Christ said to them, you give them something, he, they had just come back after having preached the kingdom of God and miraculously healed people who were sick. Mm -hmm. He had given them a taste of, what they could potentially do with the power that he had given them. 
Right, power of the spirit. So, yeah. You know, all these people need food. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that is funny. And just kind of sitting there waiting, and all the apostles looking at each other. Going, going what? He's so like, all right, give me the bread, give me the fish. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's an excellent point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. It's like expectation that they would. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But what what was their immediate thought? Oh, the supermarket is is quite a ways away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Psalm chapter 2. Do you guys remember the covenant God made with David? What was the covenant God made with David? Anybody remember? Stephen's nodding his head. Anybody else remember? Just generally, you don't have to, you know, quote it verbatim, but what did God say he was going to do for David? Go ahead, anybody? I'm sorry, Jennifer? His son would be king. Yes, that's right. David was, was king. But God said, I'm going to raise up one of your sons to sit upon your throne. And he is going to reign over the house of Israel forever. Okay, now that's quite a promise. And he's going to do it in justice and in judgment and so forth. All right, he's going to be the king that lasts forever. Sitting upon your throne, reigning over Israel. And so David writes all these psalms, which are songs, and it interwoven throughout these songs are prophecies that are related to that promise that God had given him that one of his descendants would become um, the king. And not only that, when, he, when God made the promise to David, when he said it's going to be one of your sons, he also went on to say, I will be his father and he will be my son. Interesting. Now, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense if you're looking at it from David's perspective because he's going to be David's son. How's, how's he going to be God's son if he's David's son? All right. But God worked all that stuff out through the virgin birth and all that uh, later. All right. But David now, in writing this psalm by inspiration of God as a prophet, in fact, Acts 2 says that David was a prophet and that, that when he wrote these psalms, God was speaking through him. So here's what he says, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And the word anointed there is Messiah in Hebrew. Or if you were reading it in the Greek version, it would be Christos, which is rendered Christ in English. All right, They all mean the same thing in different languages. <clears throat> and so that's where that term uh, Christ comes from in the Gospels from this passage. And what do these kings say as they rise up against God and against his Christ? Here's what they say. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And now, beginning in verse 7, we have the words of Jesus given prophetically by David, saying this, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and the Greek version says you will shepherd them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Isn't that an amazing song? He's called the Son of God in this passage. When, God, when the Father says to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he is called the Christ in verse 2, where it says, the kings rise up against the Lord and against his anointed or against his Christ. There, So he's referred to, this, the, the expression, the son of God, and the expression, the Christ, they're both titles for Jesus that come out of Psalm chapter 2. All right, that's where they come from. And they are, and they are, they even this kind of terminology originates all the way back in the promise that God gave to David 
that David's son would sit upon his throne and reign as king forever, and that God would, would somehow make David's son his son. Okay? The son of God, the Christ, the anointed one, the king of Israel. All right, so we get to uh, Luke chapter 9. And uh, Jesus says to his disciples, who do, who do you say I am? And Peter, normally Peter, you know, he's tripping over his own tongue and saying all the wrong things. But in this particular case, he was right on target. Isn't that right? The Christ of God. In fact, in, I think it's Matthew's account. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Using the full title that's in Psalm chapter 2. <clears throat> and he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one. What? What? All this that comes out of Psalm 2, that Jesus is the one who fulfills Psalm 2, and Jesus has been sending them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and now he says to them, don't tell anybody this. Now you tell me why. Go ahead, Kathy. Your hand was up first. Ah, if you get it wrong, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I probably will. I just think the timing would have been off. All right. The timing would have been off. Okay. Was it evident for people who were a little bit discerning, who maybe knew the prophecies in the Old Testament, was it already evident that Jesus was the, the Messiah? How? How? Okay, good. What did Nicodemus say? So we, we know that nobody does what you do without... Unless God is with him, right? Okay. The, when John the Baptist sent some of his followers to Jesus and said, are you the Christ? Or are you the one who's coming? Or should we wait for somebody else? And what did Jesus say to him? Go tell John that the blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the deaf hear, lepers are being cleansed, now, it's kind of a roundabout way of answering John's question, wasn't it? But why did he answer it that way? Because Isaiah the prophet said that this is what the Messiah would do, and that the kingdom that the Messiah would bring would be characterized by the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the lame walking, you know, and, and all these diseases being done away with, right? That's how the Messiah's kingdom will be characterized according to Isaiah. Now, people who understood <coughs> the prophecies in the Old Testament and who took them seriously, when they saw this guy coming around doing all these miracles and doing the very things that Isaiah said that the Messiah would do and would be characteristic of his kingdom, what do you think they would suspect if they truly believed the prophets? This guy is, I think he's the Messiah, right? But did Jesus go around claiming and with a, you know with a big banner at the front of his uh, you know parade saying I am the Messiah the King of Israel? Did he do that? No. It was very subtle. It was very very subtle. And why was it very subtle? Kathy, you had it right. Why was it very subtle? Um, timing. timing. Timing is everything. Isn't that right? What happened when it became, when it was being proclaimed loudly and boldly that Jesus was the Messiah, the King of Israel? What happened then? What, what was the occasion when that happened? Does anybody know? No, no, before that. Palm Sunday, which is today. What, what, what happened on Palm Sunday? He went up on the Mount of Olives. He took the, the donkey, right? Why? Because Zechariah had prophesied years earlier that the Messiah would come to Jerusalem riding on a colt, on a donkey. And so Jesus had the, his disciples and go and get the donkey, and he got on the donkey, and they all began, the crowds, as they were approaching Jerusalem to keep the Passover, <clears throat> the crowds were put it, throwing palm branches in the way. And what were they, what were they crying out? Hosanna! to the son of David, right? Why? The son of David is the Messiah, the king. And they got this big procession and Jesus is riding the colt with all these people shouting this stuff and waving palm branches. I mean, that's not, that's not exactly tell this to no one, <laughs> is it? 
And what happened when this big procession got to Jerusalem? That very Passover, they crucified him. Because they didn't want this king to reign over them. Isn't that right? Why did Jesus tell them not to be proclaiming this publicly now? Because it wasn't time yet. Because he knew what would happen when they did. And that is, the pressure would be on big time. And he knew it wasn't time for that yet. Okay? So that's why. All right, verse 22. Now, here's what I want you to notice. In verse 22, we have the very first time that Jesus said anything at all to his disciples about the fact that he was going to be crucified. Prior to this, they thought that during, you know, that, that, that during this time, this, this was sort of like, you know, Jesus going around healing people and, and them following him was sort of like a prelude to his, you know, seizing the kingdom by force and overthrowing the Romans and setting up his kingdom on the earth. That's what they were anticipating happening. Even though there are prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about his death, like Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and others, they were anticipating that he would become king right away. And so they didn't, this whole idea that the guy that they thought was going to be the king is going to be killed, you know, that, that didn't, didn't fit in with their plan very well, right? They thought, you know, hey, he's the Messiah. Okay, we can't tell anybody yet, but pretty soon we will. And uh, hey, hey, we're with him. Right? I mean, that's kind of the way they felt about this. And, uh, and so what does Jesus say? He tells them first, don't tell anyone yet that I'm the Messiah. Secondly, he says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Wow. That just did not fit in with their plan at all. This is the first time this happened. How do we know this is the first time Jesus said that? Because actually the, there's a parallel statement of this exact incident in Mark chapter 8. Just flip there for just a minute. <clears throat> and uh, Mark 8, 31. It says this, and he began, and I want you to note the word began. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and after three days, rise again. And he spoke this word openly, that is, to his disciples. He was telling them repeatedly and openly that this was going to happen to him. And they need to brace for it, essentially, is what he's telling them. All right, that's the first time. All right, let's continue reading. <clears throat> Look what he says in verse... Um, uh, 23 in, in Luke 9. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me. Now, what does that mean, to come after me? It means to follow me. All right? It's essentially the meaning of the word disciple. <clears throat> if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, by saying take up his cross, Jesus was dropping a really big hint about the manner in which he was going to be executed, right, by the cross. If anyone desires to be my disciple, see, it's one thing to be a disciple of the guy who's going to become king. Everybody wants to be his pal. It's another thing to be a disciple of the one who's going to death row and is going to be executed. Isn't that right? Totally different ballgame. You know, the glory of the king will spill over onto his associates and his followers. But the stigma of the one who's about to be executed will also spill over onto his followers. Isn't that right? And so Jesus is warning them. He says, look, if you want to be my disciple, it's not going to be an easy road where you're going to, you know, receive praise and glory and a great position in my kingdom. That's not how it's going to happen. My road is not easy. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to be persecuted. And if you want to follow me, yes, the ultimate destination is the kingdom. But if you want to follow me, this is what the path looks like. See, it's not all that prosperity, health and wealth gospel that you hear preached on the TV. 
it's a, it's a gospel of picking up your cross, which is your means of execution, and following Jesus down that difficult path that leads to life. All right? It's not an easy path. And don't let anybody tell you it is. It requires a lot of sacrifice. Verse 24. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does that mean? What does he mean by whoever loses his life for my sake? Gives up his uh, personal ambitions in life and seeks to follow what Christ has been doing. He chooses to follow his path instead of his own path. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's exactly what Paul said he did. Isn't that right? That he counted all his accomplishments as rubbish so that he might partake in that resurrection of et to eternal life. And uh, that's what Jesus is saying here for us as well. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve three masters. You've got to have one. Okay? For what profit is to a man if he gains the whole world, that is, he's pursuing all the things that he wants, and is himself destroyed or lost? Now, this is interesting. The word lost there is not a good translation of the Greek. The word lost literally means to suffer loss or to suffer injury. Not to be yourself lost, you know, I'm so lost I cannot be found. Not like that. It means to suffer injury, to suffer loss. That is, to, um, to, to be injured. Now, it's interesting that Jesus has two possibilities here. He says, what is, what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed? And the word destroyed there means completely annihilated, wiped out, or suffer injury. And what he's saying is these are the two possible outcomes. If, if, <clears throat> if you try to pursue the things of this world as a Christian, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to suffer injury or you're going to be completely destroyed. All right? You might not end up being totally destroyed. You might make it into the kingdom just barely, but you're going to suffer injury and loss. Or you might not make it at all. That's what he's saying. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in the Father's and of the holy angels. Now this is clearly a picture of what it's going to look like when the kingdom of God actually arrives. It's not going to look like a man all beaten up carrying a cross to his execution. It's going to look like his coming in glory and the glory of the Father and all the holy angels with him. That's what it's going to look like when he arrives to establish his kingdom. All right. So he, he, he puts that, he, he doesn't dash their hopes <clears throat> of seeing the coming of the kingdom by saying, I'm going to be crucified. He, but, but what he does is he tries to put it into perspective so that they realize that between now and the time of his coming in glory with all the holy angels when he establishes his kingdom, between now and then, there's a tough, tough road if you're going to follow me. That's what he's saying. It's a tough road. All right? Get ready for the tough road. This is not the gospel you normally hear in churches, is it? <laughs> No. Uh, yeah, Walter. We were just saying before about uh, we were destroying all that. There's also the parallel of Mark uh, 8, uh, 36, where what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Knowing what soul really is, it's a total it's, destruction. That it's, the whole yeah, that's right. All right, verse 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Okay, wait a minute. Let's get this right. Don't tell anybody who I am. I'm the Messiah, yeah, but don't tell anybody. And then what does he say? Because I'm going to be killed. All right, and I'm going to rise the third day. And then what does he say? He talks about the tough road that's going to be for his disciples. He talks about 
somebody evaluating which road they're going to take. Do I want to just pursue the things of this world and lose everything, or do I want to pursue the tough road that following Christ means and, and receive in the end life in the kingdom? So then he talks about his coming with his holy angels. And then he says, I'm telling you that some of you who are standing here right now are not going to die before you see the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people, this has thrown a lot of people into a lot of bad theology because they misunderstand what Jesus was saying. They say, many people, and these class of people are called preterists, they claim that Jesus came back back in the lifetime of the apostles, that he returned from heaven, that he set up his kingdom in sort of some mystical way on the earth, that there was some kind of a mystical resurrection of the dead, but nobody actually saw any bodies come out of the graves, and that all this stuff about his kingdom, it's all past. All right, that's, what they, that's what they claim. And they take it from this passage of Scripture because Jesus said that some of the ones who were there, some of his disciples, <clears throat> would not die before they saw the kingdom of God. The problem is they stop there and they don't continue reading because Jesus then took three of them and he showed it to them. Right? Look what he says. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, that is, after he told them this, that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. <clears throat> Then it happened as they were parting, parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, now this is where, you know, Peter sticks his foot in his mouth. Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles or tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered into the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Now, where else is Jesus identified as the father's son? Psalm 2, right? You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is a reference to Psalm 2 also. But we have the father himself speaking out of heaven and acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ that is talked about in Psalm 2 to his disciples, confirming what Peter already said about him. That's good. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. Now, if you read Matthew's account of this, it says that when they came down from the mountain, Jesus said to his disciples, tell the vision to no one until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Matthew 17:9. Okay. He called it a vision. What is a vision? Everywhere else in the Bible, what is a vision? When someone sees a vision, do they see something that is substantive, that's actually occurring? Or are they seeing what's like a movie or a portrayal of something that's not really real or there at that time? Which is, which is it? Well, it's not really there, but it's something that's, I guess, is coming. It's a, it's a means of showing them what is going to happen visually without that thing actually occurring in the material world. Like a window into the future. Exactly right. It's a window into the future. It's sort of like it's a prophecy. Instead of being done in words, it's done in video <laughs> before their very eyes. That's what a vision is. And there are many of these visions uh, in, the, in the Bible. In fact... It uses the same term when it talked about Peter um, <clears throat> when he was in Acts, <clears throat> when he was about to go to court, or he, he, he didn't know, but God was going to send him to Cornelius' house to preach the Gentiles, and he saw a vision of a sheep being let down from heaven filled with all kinds of unclean animals, and God said to him, Peter, rise up and kill and eat. 
And Peter's like, no, I can't eat anything unclean, you know. And God taught him a lesson through that, but it was a vision. Was there really a sheet? If other people had been there, you know, sitting in the room while Peter was laying there, would they have seen a big sheet coming down from heaven with, you know, elephants and, and uh, reptiles and all this stuff hanging out of it? No. See, that was something that went on in Peter's mind before his own eyes that God did as a miracle to show Peter something. All right? But it wasn't actually happening in the real material world. And so that's how Jesus described this event to his disciples later. He said that it was a vision. He said, tell this vision to no one. All right, so that's the first thing you need to understand. Did Moses, were Moses and Elijah actually resurrected from the dead and were standing there? No, it was a vision of Moses and Elijah and Jesus. But I want you to also notice something <clears throat> important. It says here that they appeared in glory. And this kind of an expression is used throughout the New Testament in reference to those who are resurrected in the resurrection. It's a, it's a term that ref, refers to Jesus. In fact, in John's Gospel, it talks about, um, when Jesus was talking about the living water and all that kind of stuff, it says that he spoke this about the Holy Spirit, which had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. It uses the same terminology referring to Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he was glorified because he was now immortal. Okay, And it, Colossians says that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we also shall appear with him in glory. Yeah. It's the resurrection when we are raised to immortality that we will stand beside Christ, the immortal one, then because he has been raised from the dead and we appear with him in glory. So when, when it says here, that they saw Jesus and his face shone, and then Moses and Elijah appeared in glory. It's, this is kind of code word in the New Testament for in a resurrected form. It, they were appearing in this vision as though they had been raised from the dead, as though the day of the second coming had already come, as though they had been raised from the dead from their graves, and Jesus is glorified, and they're standing there with Jesus, and they're, and they're chatting with Jesus. And that's what they saw. What were they seeing? Were they seeing what was going on in the here and now? Or were they seeing a vision of the future kingdom? Yes. How do we know that? Well, it's a vision, number one. But two, what did Jesus say at the beginning of all this? There are some standing here which shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So what were they seeing? Eight days later, the kingdom of God. And who were the ones standing there? Peter, James, and John. See, Jesus took them up to do exactly what he said was going to happen. They were going to see the kingdom of God. So they saw the future. That's what you have to understand. They saw the future. And what was the future like? Jesus and, and Moses and Elijah are all standing around in their glorified state chatting about his, his crucifixion. Now, you may notice it says, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, but that's an editorial comment by Luke. Luke is telling the readers of his gospel that Jesus is going to die. It wasn't that Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about the fact that he was still going to die in the future. They were talking about his death that had already happened. But <clears throat> Luke records for his readers, which was going to happen at Jerusalem because... Just a few verses earlier, in Luke's narrative here, Jesus had first introduced this whole concept that he was going to die as kind of a surprise. It'd be a surprise to his disciples, but it would also be a surprise to the readers of Luke's gospel who are reading this for the very first time, right? It'd be a surprise to learn that this Jesus, who was supposed to be the Messiah, was going to die. But Jesus comforts them, those three men, by showing them in a vision what the kingdom is going to look like. Well, what does that do for them? It gives them courage to press on through the difficulties that come by following Christ. Isn't that right? Because they saw with their own eyes what the kingdom is going to be like. Now, <clears throat> Peter talks about this in um, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's just go there for a minute. We have a few minutes left. <clears throat> Yeah. 
In 2 Peter, um, Peter was, this was uh, really Peter's last written words before his execution in A.D. 67. Uh, that's when Peter was executed, the year after Paul was executed. And, uh, and Peter is sitting there in his prison cell waiting to be executed, and he <clears throat> decides to write a last, sort of a last book as, a, as his final words to the churches. And he says, um, verse 12, um, well, verse, uh, actually, let's go back to verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Look, if you follow that difficult path is what he's talking about. As Peter had followed his whole life, and now he was about to be killed for his faith, and he's exhorting others to follow that same faithful path. He says, For this reason I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yet I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, that is this state of mortality and decay, to stir you up, by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, that is, his life, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. And that's what he's writing this for. And so what does he say? Look what he says next. For we, that is Peter, James, and John, we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and the coming, notice this, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For, we rece for he received from God the Father honor, glory, and such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. I love that statement. See, the prophets talk about the coming of Christ and setting up of his kingdom all throughout their writings. And now the apostle says, and now we, that is Peter, James, and John, we have the prophetic word confirmed. Why? Because we saw it with our own eyes when Jesus showed us what his coming kingdom was going to look like when he took us up on that mountain. Which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in the dark place. What are you heeding? The eyewitness testimony of Peter, James, and John about this incident that they saw with their own eyes. Jesus showed them a vision of his coming kingdom. Until the day dawns. And uh, actually, it's um, morning star is a bad translation. It's the one clothed with light arises and that's a reference to what Jesus how Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mark says that in his gospel that Jesus shone his garments shone whiter than any launderer could whiten them. Shone so brightly. And that's what he's talking about. The one the one clothed with light arises. In your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. And he goes on to confirm that what the prophets wrote was true in in and of themselves being led by the Holy Spirit. However, we have more than just the prophets. We have the eyewitness testimony of the apostles who Jesus showed um, to confirm the testimony of the prophets. He showed it to his disciples and then he sent them out to proclaim that throughout the world. Okay, any questions or comments about this chapter or incident? Yeah. Comforting? Yeah. I think it was comforting for Jesus every time he heard the Father's voice come down from heaven. I mean, because this happened on more than one occasion where the Father said, this is my beloved Son, as a reference to Psalm 2. Because what does Psalm 2 say? It puts words in the Father's mouth. Jesus is saying that the Father said to me, you are my Son. And then we have him actually doing that again and again in the Gospels from heaven with his big voice from heaven confirming that not only to Jesus but to those around him who heard the voice as well. So yeah, you're right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Stephen? The, uh, I'm 
I'm trying to look at the sequence of things in this section that we've just gone through. We start out by seeing the disciples being given power and authority going out preaching and performing miracles. And then when they come back, he challenges them, you know, what I was saying before about, you know, you, you feed the crowd. So he challenges mm -hmm. them and then he has to, to fill in yeah. where their lack of knowledge and understanding would allow them to perhaps do that. Yep. Then he says, things are going to get really hard. Yeah. I'm going to die, and if you're going to follow me, you're going to get beat up. You better be prepared to die too. Yes. Take your and, cross. And then he, yeah. he takes his inner circle, men who <coughs> eventually become leaders among the apostles themselves, right? Peter they were. And John, yep. And shows them the future. And it, it would seem that as he's getting closer and closer to his crucifixion, he is preparing his core, he's preparing his leadership mm -hmm. with the things that they would need to sustain them through those different. That's exactly right. Yep. And not only that, but he's also laying down the foundation for the churches for later. As Peter is saying, you know, I, here's my last words. The Lord showed me that I'm about to die. I want to put these things down in writing so that after my decease, you have this confirmation. And then he goes on to give his eyewitness testimony of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, this is a more sure word of prophecy. Right. He's let, he's, what he's doing is he's, he's giving us objective evidence that what he said was true. <clears throat> and, um, and actually, if you continue reading in this chapter, <clears throat> in Luke 9, it's not long after this that he starts telling the disciples again and again and again that he's going to die. If you go down to verse 44, he says to them, Let these words sink down into your ears. Now, what's he say to them? He's hammering it into their heads. Don't let what I'm saying go right over your head. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. He said, let these words sink down into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. That was the second time. Walter, are you about to say something? Go ahead. Yeah. And Jews were being executed for their faith. And when you look at that picture he's saying, to me it's not just what he's showing them about his execution, but be willing every day to pick up your cross and carry that cross to your execution, to your death for my sin. He's taking that to that level. Yeah, if it comes today. Yeah. Today, every day be willing to take up your cross. Well, that, what that essentially means is every day of your life, from the moment you decide to follow Christ until the day of the resurrection or the day you die, your life can be, have these same kinds of difficulties that Jesus was about to face, and you need to be prepared for that. That's what he's saying. He wasn't painting a picture, a rosy picture of an easy road of, you know, um, you know health and prosperity and you know, living large, and, um, and then, you know, one day, you know, Jesus is going to call us, you know, with the great sound of a trumpet to um, out of our padded pews and limousines to be into his presence in heaven, as was, is typically taught in most churches. You know, have a fluffy cloud ride into the sky to live happily ever after. La, la, la. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. It's a fairy tale. That's not what the Bible presents. It says we're going to have, Paul says in Acts, when he went around to the churches he established, he says that you know, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Is the kingdom of God going to be great and glorious? You better believe it. Is it going to be a hard road between now and then? Yes, it is. All right. <clears throat> 